So maybe if we do start with perhaps a brief overview of the history of vegetable oils and how they are such a recent component of um, human diets, might be a good place to start. Right. So, so let me start with this, Susan. First, I think the audience needs to know, um, and they can watch uh, my presentation at Low Carb Denver, which I know you're going to link to, and I did one last summer at the Ancestral Health Symposium, which you can yeah, get to on YouTube. But, um, but let me just say very briefly that in the 19th century, between 1800 and about 1900 or 1920 or so, heart disease was an extraordinary medical rarity. For example, there was eight uh, published papers on heart disease in the 19th century. Um, uh, even uh, angina, Sir William Osler reviewed angina, the chest pain that's associated with heart disease. And in 1897, he published a paper reviewing his previous 21 years of hospital experience and he noted maybe a half a dozen cases of angina, chest pain. He'd never witnessed or heard of a heart attack ever in, in 1897. But in, by 1910, 13 years later, he had witnessed 208 additional cases of angina, chest pain, still had not seen a heart attack. James Herrick in the United States published the first known case of heart attack in 1912. So, Physicians of the United States, although a very few of them were aware of what a heart attack was, virtually no one had seen one in 1910, for example. But by the 1930s, heart attack um, or coronary heart disease was the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and then, so it, and it continued to increase. And so today, it's 32.1%, I believe, of people die of coronary artery-related heart disease. In the United States, it's virtually one out of three. If you look at cancer, for example, we have data from published papers. Uh, like, For example, in the town of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, United States, in 1811, uh, cancer took one of 188 people. By 1900, Cancer took the lives of one in 17. Today, it's 31.2% as of 2010, I believe it was. So again, it's almost one in three. Type two diabetes, for example, um, uh, absolute medical rarity in the 19th century. By 1935, we're rising to 0.37%. That was our first study. It progressively increased to, I think, 9.4% type 2 diabetes in the United States by 2015 and still climbing. But the increase between 1935 and 2015 was 25-fold increase in type 2 diabetes. How about obesity? So these prisoner studies from uh, the, from the United States, uh, the, the states of uh, Nebra uh, Nebraska and Texas, they analyzed, they took the weight and height of men age 18 to 80 in the 19th century. And there was a researcher that put this all together and he, so you could establish the, the BMI, the, the, the body mass index, and it was, so obesity was 1.2% in the 19th century in the United States. Um, but, you know, in the U.S., we thought we were fantastically lean in 1960. But in 1960, obesity was already 13%. It had risen 11-fold in 60 years. And so it continued to climb, 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 you know, all the way to 2015 is the latest data that I'm aware of. We're at 39.8%. We're roughly 40% obesity. And the latest study that came out just a few weeks ago showed we're on target to be 50% obesity, meaning a BMI over 30 in the United States by 2030. So we're 10 years away from half of the population being obese. And then I don't know how many would be, you know, collectively obese and overweight. Um, but, you know, in 2015, I think it was 68 or 69 close to 70% of Americans are either obese or 
significantly overweight. All right, so let's go back. Let's talk about you know processed food. So sugar is a man-made processed food, and it was the consumption was extremely low in the 19th century. Um, so we know that uh, Stephen Guillenay did put together this research, public good published research. So from 1822 to 1999 sugar in the United States went up 17 fold. It went from six pounds per person per year to 108 pounds per person per year. So sugar is a nutrient deficient food, right? I mean, that's just part of the problem. Okay, yeah. the fructose part of it, if you consume enough, becomes toxic. Okay, the next processed food, vegetable oils. So for 99.8% of the world, nobody in the world had ever seen a polyunsaturated vegetable oil in the world until after the American Civil War ended in 1865. So um, 1866, manufacturers had tested cottonseed oil, which they had fed to cattle, and it didn't kill the cattle, so they started putting it in the food supply. But they didn't let people know. They started adulterating our lard and then our butter. They were putting it in there up to 40%, Susan. And people didn't know it, but they started noticing something was wrong. And then we started sending it to Europe. And the, the French made complaint, for example, in 1880, that we were, you know, we were adulterating our um, um, olive oil and our lard, I believe it was both, if I remember right. But um, anyway, we were adulterating that with uh, cottonseed oil uh, by 1880. But anyway, so um, by, you know, by uh, 1909, soybean oil was introduced, and then we got all the others. And all these dangerous oils collectively, these polyunsaturated oils, Susan, I always try to name these. They are um, they are soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. Those are the main ones, and those account for 99% or more of our polyunsaturated oil consumption that's really dangerous. And what happened was is that these oils began to replace and supplant butter, lard, and beef tallow, the animal fats that kept us so healthy for thousands of years. And so if you look at 1900 in the US, 99% of the added fats, and this is all published, everything I'm telling you is published evidence, published data. 1900, 99% of the added fats in the American diet were animal fats, lard, butter, and beef tallow. By 2005, 86% of the added fats came from vegetable oils, 86%. So the vegetable oils, in terms of added fats, almost completely supplanted and replaced animal fats in terms of our added fats. And this became, in the United States, our data that we published in 2010, 32.5% of the American diet came from these vegetable oils. 32, uh, basically a third of the diet yeah. is these oils. All right, so then we get, uh, you know, we get 1880, we get refined white wheat flour because of what's called roller mill technology. Well, refined wheat flour is a nutrient deficient food. Wheat is 20% of the world's diet today in the United States. 85.3% of that is refined, meaning it's nutrient deficient. So that works out to be 17% of the diet right there is a nutrient deficient food just from wheat. The final thing in terms of processed food really is, is you know, to get to finish the big picture is it's trans fats. And we, those came initially from Procter and Gamble was the company that introduced these. They're hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, which they, they fabricated out of cottonseed oil initially to, to look like lard. And that became, that was another way that they introduced these into the food supply and to compete with lard and butter. And so that was another way that, you know, those, those foods began to supplant our, uh, you know, our good, healthy animal fats. So that's kind of the big picture. So by 2009 in the United States, if you look at refined wheat flour, sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats, 
Um, that right there is 63% of the American diet. And if you add in alcohol, it's another four to 7%. Um, and uh, if so total, we're at around 70 to 75% uh, of the American diet is made up of uh, ultra processed foods. And again, these don't have, they don't have nutrients. For example, butter from pasture, pastured butter, which comes from cows grazing on grass is a great source of fat. It's a great source of nutrients. It's got vitamins A, D, and K2 to some degree. No, it's not the greatest source of vitamins A and D, but all of the vegetable oils, for example, all of them don't have any vitamins at all except for vitamin E and vitamin K1, but they don't have vitamins A, D, or K2, none of them, even the healthy ones, which I would characterize as like, for example, coconut oil, very healthy oil, almost, you know, it's 91 to 94 and a half percent saturated. It's fantastic. It's got a long track record of health and success with every population that has consumed it, as far as I know, but it, even that has no uh, fat soluble vitamins A, D, and K2, which you would get in pastured butter and pastured eggs, for example. So we've replaced all these really nutrient defense, nutrient dense foods like pastured butter, pastured uh, eggs, um, you know, organ meats like liver and other organs, uh, fish eggs, you know, fish roe. We've replaced all of these nutrient dense, fantastically healthy foods, primarily with vegetable oils. And we haven't even gotten into the toxicity. That's just the nutrient deficiency. But that's kind of the big picture of what, what really happened. And you know what we see in every population all around the world, wherever these foods go, as Weston Price showed in the 1930s and 1940s, Wherever these foods go, what, what follows is, is disaster to the health. It begins with uh, you know, abnormal dentition in our children, crooked teeth, narrowed faces, cavities, um, abscess teeth in adults, followed by arthritis, like I had, cancers. And then you know, we've had just thousands and thousands of studies that collectively show that you, know, you, you put these foods together and you'll drive all of this chronic uh, degenerative and metabolic disease. All of these chronic degenerative diseases follow processed foods. It's that simple. That's, that's a, quite an incredible story. There's a couple of things in there I just want to expand on just briefly. Um, people will say, in New Zealand, I'm not sure what the States is like, that we, that we don't have trans fats in our food, but I have heard you talk about trans fats being in these PUFA oils. Is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? That is absolutely correct. Uh, in the, the, the United States, I think, has, they, they put, they banned trans fats supposedly and they're supposed to be out of our food supply. Number one, they're not. But more, more importantly, even if they got them out of all of the processed foods and all of them had 0.0, .0 grams of trans fats, here's something that is a massive oversight is that the, and this is proven, I'm not, I will never, if I tell you anything that doesn't come from, from scientifically uh, published data, I will tell you, but the studies show um, and there's several of these that uh, have looked at a number of different vegetable oils and the um, trans fats range in these oils from 0% in some of them, that would be a really, you know, relatively good vegetable oil up to 4.6%, I believe it was, um, trans fats averaged 1.1% trans fats in these oils. So if you take a, an average American consuming 80 grams a day, take 1.1% of that, it works out to be about 0.8 grams, I think, roughly, of trans fats. So this Every is what, mm. yeah, and, and, and the, the, the U.S. 
FDA has not established that there's any level of trans fats that are okay. I mean, they're all dangerous. They're, they're, they're kind of, you know, uh, from a chemical standpoint, they're kind of like uh, a wax or a plastic. And um, they're associated with many different chronic diseases. But the point to, you know, to get to the answer is, is that if you are consuming vegetable oils, you are consuming trans fats, or it would be extraordinarily unlikely if you could get one that was zero grams uh, of trans fat. And that alone is, I mean, th that's yet another of the many, many problems where vegetable oils are associated with toxicity. Mm. Thanks for clarifying that, because I know people will jump in and say, oh, we don't have trans fats in New Zealand. So I think it, that's an important clarification.